control Her gravity is all that I know She's over me She's over me She comes me with her hypnotic dance She holds me here with only a glance She's over me everybody welcome to the paranormal portal bedtime stories from beyond i'm your host brent thomas and i'm hoping you're having a great day happy monday eve to you or monday after eve or whatever however the hell it is it's no longer almost monday so um <laughs> i hope your monday went well though i i think mine went okay as far as i uh as far as i know it felt okay <clears throat> i don't think i screwed up anything or you know hurt anybody's feelings too bad that i, <laughs> that I know about but anyway um you guys uh, are all here coming in the door. I see the numbers flying up as the people are coming in. Um, nothing really going on today. If I uh, hope you guys remembered to check out the podcast. Of course, the podcast releases Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And today's episode was Mysterious Ancient Civilizations. And uh, I liked that episode a lot. It was a lot of fun to, to record. It was a lot of fun to talk about. And I learned an awful lot doing it. Um, it's not something that I've ever put a lot of focus into. I'm generally more focused on what are people experiencing, what's going on that people are dealing with right now. And, you know, to me, that's always been the most exciting thing. But I got to tell you, I was uh, absolutely having a good time talking about the ancient mysterious civilizations and all of the mysteries surrounding them, uh, such as a lot of advanced technologies that they should very well not have had according to uh, popular thinking and, and so much more. So if you haven't checked it out, please go over to Pandora, Spotify, iHeart, iTunes, and uh, give it a download and subscribe if you would, please. And if you're, if you've listened to the podcast and you like what you're hearing, please head over to iTunes and give us a good rating. Uh, it really does a lot to help uh, iTunes promote us to more listeners, and it'll definitely help the portal to grow. Uh, it'll mean an awful lot to us because we're still a, you know, we're growing uh, by leaps and bounds, but the portal is really still a, a very little operation, you know, in the in the grand scheme of things. I mean, we're you know we're we're a small operation, but we're we're really excited and encouraged by what we see happening um, in in our in our listeners and and those who are a part of the family um how how that is spreading and growing and so uh, every little bit that you guys do really means the world to us it really goes a long way in promoting the portal and i take a lot of uh, pride in the fact that we have we have never spent a dollar advertising this show ever it's always been word of mouth people finding it and talking about it with people they know uh, it's been completely grassroots growth that we've had, and maybe that's why it's grown so slowly, but I, I really feel that the people that are here and that are involved in the show are here because they want to be, not because some, you know, somebody went on a group of, uh, you know, where everybody subs and likes and stuff, and they say, hey, everybody head over to this channel and sub and like, um, and you get a bunch of numbers, but there's not many people really paying attention to what you're doing. And you see channels like that on YouTube all the time. They'll have, you know, 20, 30, 40,000 subscribers, but they'll still get only, uh, you know, a few hundred views on what they're doing. And it's like, well, that doesn't make a lot of sense. And so I think that might be what happens in some of those cases. But everybody that's been involved in the portal, I think you guys, uh, oh, yeah, Beth. Beth got her shirt today. Thank you so much for that, by the way, Beth. That was awesome. It helps us a ton. Um, but everybody, everybody that's paying attention and, and involved in the portal through subs or through, you know, uh, their comments, through their participation are people that truly want to be here. And so that's why we have the greatest audience in the world. 
everyone here wants to be here. Now, um, Beth did order a t-shirt, uh, and I hope you like it, Beth. I hope you felt like it was a, a well-made shirt. And, uh, um, I, of course got, I saw the picture that you sent in about that. I'm going to put together a collage of everybody who has bought shirts and, you know, and, and some, some form of gear or another that we can track because, uh, well, those that send in pictures anyway, but where Beth found it was she went, she went over here and, uh, she looks like a good segue of where to talk about our portal gear, ladies and gentlemen. Now, um, it's never easy to ask people to help, um, uh, for any reason. Um, you know, for me, most of all my whole life, um, most everything I've done, I, I've really done for myself. Uh, I haven't had a whole lot handed to me. Uh, and when I have had things handed to me, it never worked out well for me personally. So everything that I've ever had, I've kind of earned. And so, uh, it's never a comfortable place for me to ask people to, to help or something. But, uh, you know, I, I just feel like this gives us the opportunity to give you something for your help. Um, and so I, I like, I feel better about things like the shirts and the coffee mugs and the stickers than I do about anything else. Cause I, I mean, I'm absolutely humbled by all the f uh, amazing donations we've received. I really am. But I always feel, feel like, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I feel more comfortable on a, on a, an emotional level when people buy something that they have then and, uh, and can keep in their possession as a result of their kindness. And, uh, so I hope, I hope it's also people want to wear this mark, the paranormal portal mark. Um, but head over to teespring.com and the, and the link is in the description of the show, but it's teespring.com slash stores slash paranormal dash portal. And, uh, this is our shop over here on Teespring. And, uh, thank you so much, Beth, for helping us out with that. We've, uh, had a, a bunch of sales lately and that really goes so far in helping us with our future goals and plans and, and helps keep it afloat. Um, I just, uh, learned that in a, in a sh very short period of time in our neck of the woods, we're going to have, uh, we're, <laughs> we're going to have the option to have fiber, fiber optic internet. And, uh, that's something I'm definitely going to be going for, for the show because, this cable stuff, it, it works out okay, but we get leg spikes and we get weirdness that shouldn't be happening because it's on the cable networks. And for the home users, it's, you know, normally not a big deal whether they have cable or DSL or, you know, fiber. But when you're doing a show and you need that connection to be pristine, you need it to be quick and, and responsive, um, we really do need that upgrade. So that'll be something we're going to be getting. It's going to be a little more expensive every month. But hopefully it'll be a lot more reliable. So, uh, but head over to the if you want to help support what we're doing, head over to the teespring.com slash stores slash paranormal dash portal. It just means a bunch to us. And uh, you know, we hope that you'll <laughs> you'll help us out for sure. But anyway, I guess that's enough of me yapping about all this stuff. And I just want to say I hope you guys are ready because it's time for bed. <laughs> All right, so we got a paranormal portal bedtime stories for from beyond for y'all, and uh, I got some stories pulled up, of course, as I always do. Yeah, I feel warm. I feel mine, but I'm gonna turn on the fan. It was actually warmer here than it's been in a long time, and so, I mean, the heater's on and stuff in the house, but uh, in the studio, it's just really balmy. And I guess I got a sweatshirt on. I could have taken that off, but well, you know, I don't want to be all inappropriate here, so I'll just turn on the fan quick, but let's, let's roll with the show. Okay. Oh, Don's in here. Hey, Don, Don, hope you're having a good day, brother. Uh, Don will be here of course on, uh, on Wednesday for our normally scheduled Wednesday two hour show. Um, but, uh, let's see, where am I at? Here we go. So the first story I got pulled up for you guys is from Wisconsin tonight. Uh, and, uh, has to do with, uh, apparently visitations by deceased family or friends. So it says my grandmother died from complications of having a stroke about 10 years ago after having the stroke, uh, my grandfather, 
Grandfather. Yeah, I thought I said grandmother. After having the stroke, he was unable to use the left side of his body. He spent the last year of his life living with family members, and he would spend a month at my house, and then the next month at my cousin's house. And Because of the stroke, my grandfather sometimes lost control of his urine and bowel movements, and when my grandfather lived at my house, we would always reserve a seat of blankets and pillows for him, and after his death, we packed up all his belongings into the basement. Two years after my grandfather died, my brother-in-law and other family members came to visit us, and my sister was in charge of finding enough blankets and pillows for the guests, and she went down to the basement and found my grandfather's blankets and pillows. She had forgotten that they belonged to my grandfather and retrieved them for the guest. The lucky person who got my grandfather's blankets and pillows was my brother-in-law, and the night he slept on the sofa in the living room, and the next morning... When I woke up at 7 a.m., I noticed that my brother-in-law was already awake, and I asked him, did you sleep well? And he responded, uh, not really. My brother-in-law stated that he slept pretty well until about 4 or 5 in the morning when he was awakened by some slight knocking and rubbing at the doors to the bedrooms of the house. My house is a ranch style, and the bedrooms are attached to a hall in front of the living room. He could tell that the rubbing was coming from the furthest bedroom door down the hall, and he just ignored it. And then the rubbing moved to the next bedroom door, and he thought to himself that this was really strange. And finally it went to the bedroom door just in front of the living room, and sunrise was just beginning to set in, and my brother-in-law said he could see the living room area very clearly, and what he saw next would forever change his mind about ghosts. What he saw was an unknown old man standing in the hallway looking at him. He tried to get up, but his body felt heavy and weak. He tried to yell out, but all that came out were whispers. And he tried to convince himself that it was just a shadow, but in his mind, he knew what it was. The old man walked into the living room to where my brother-in-law was sleeping and stood next to him. <laughs> oh, man. And my brother-in-law next felt his head being slightly lifted and the pillow being tugged at by an unknown force. My brother-in-law did not feel hands or fingers. It was at this time that my brother-in-law began screaming at the top of his lungs in his mind. What came out were a series of grunts that were heard by another family member who was sleeping on the other sofa in the living room, and that other family member yelled out to ask him if my brother-in-law was okay, and at that exact moment, the pressure lifting his head disappeared and the old man standing next to him dissolved into the air. My brother-in-law remembers everything very clearly that morning and remembers even seeing the other family member getting up and calling out to see if he was okay. I showed my brother-in-law our family photo album book and he confirmed that the person he saw was my grandfather. My brother-in-law never met my grandfather when he was alive. Well, I feel bad for what happened to my brother-in-law, and I feel bad that he now refuses to spend another night in my house. <laughs> See, now that's weird. That makes you wonder, though. So why, why would the grandfather terrorize this person? Um, what, was the, what was the grandfather doing just because he was using those blankets? Was he creating some kind of connection? Um, I don't know. That's very, very, very strange. And is, was that the entirety of the grandfather's spirit? Or was that simply a part of him that was left behind from the times he stayed in that house that resonated towards those blankets? Um, and I think that that happens, ladies and gentlemen. I think that a lot of times these ghosts that we encounter, even if they are family members, maybe they're not, maybe they're not the whole spirit that was once your family member, but maybe they are the parts that just couldn't carry on to the next realm, the next whatever's beyond the veil. Maybe they weren't, those parts were more earthly and base and, and didn't, you know, m for lack of a better term, meet the criteria to pass on so that energy stays here uh, to process whatever it processes to raise its vibration in order to pass through. I don't know. I, I'm not sure if I can articulate that well enough what I'm trying to say. But in my mind, it makes a lot of sense that there's, there's a whole, there's many levels to our spirit. And I, I think that when we pass on, 
the part of us that is divine and was given to us by divinity in whatever form you want to whatever form you want to give it um that part does go back but there's other parts of us that we accumulate through our experience and some of those parts are are exceptional and and also help to raise our vibration and other parts are not so exceptional and we all have those parts i mean it's just the human condition we have those quirks we have those idiosyncrasies we have those those real stupid childish things that that we that we have and uh those parts if they don't raise along with the rest of our our vibration will be maybe shed and then whatever's left is you know and there's an old term and i used it on yesterday's show the shade um a shade means in in essence a fragment um of of what 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 was you know it's not quite a a shadow it's a shade it's a, a fragment a piece and uh so could those pieces retain a sentience and maybe be in this really weird in between confused state but i don't know that kind of stuff really because i i think if the grandfather was was if it was truly his whole spirit he would know that he was in his his son's house and maybe even have known about this uh, brother-in-law who was married into the family and was a part of the family and why would he terrorize this person so it seems to me that this whatever part of this or whatever was going on there's some oddities to it that i mean it doesn't doesn't seem like a normal process to me so i just try to understand why why that could be or what what could be going on what are the dynamics at work there because you know some of the stuff really makes sense and some of it really doesn't and so there must that must mean that there's another piece of this that we just don't understand so i don't know just some thoughts as i read but that's the beauty of the portal is that it's a discussion and so i hope you guys don't mind if i go out on these out on these spider webs every once in a while because i just have questions and I think sometimes just by me uh, stating those questions or, or trying to encapsulate them in words helps me to understand them. And then a lot of times you guys will come back with some really brilliant piece that helps me to understand as well. But I don't see any feedback on that in the chat, which is fine. Uh, just just uh, some curiosities that I carry through my life. So anyway, um, let's see what's going on here. All right, next we're going to Minnesota, which is right across the the, the river to uh, Wisconsin. I grew up on the Minnesota side of the Wisconsin-Minnesota border. I looked at Wisconsin every day. <laughs> All right, so what's going on in Wisconsin, or in Minnesota, rather? Let's see. Duke himself is a, is a, <laughs> he's a, a, a refugee from Minnesota as well, so... Duke and I, and, and uh, I think Linda is there, is also a Minnesota person, but there's several of us around. Okay, so in 1989, I was 23 and in college, and I had a roommate who was still a great friend, and we lived off campus uh, in a two-bedroom apartment in Duluth, or Duluth, <laughs> Duluth, Duluth, Minnesota. I was curious and still am about all things paranormal, so my girlfriend at the time, who did not live with us, and I experimented with my roommate's Ouija board, a board his grandmother had given him for Christmas, of all things, when he was 11 years old. But he had never used it. Uh, one night, uh, when, he, when my roommate was gone, so they had this experiment one night when the roommate was gone. Much to our mutual surprise, the Ouija board worked almost right away and answered questions in a prompt, coherent fashion. We were both more fascinated about the mechanism of the Ouija itself than we were about what questions we asked that we asked it. So we ended up asking a bunch of mundane questions about our futures that I really don't remember the specifics of too well. I do remember that the entity we contacted appeared to get angry when we asked if it was telling us the truth. The plan chat would move much faster and more forcefully when it was challenged as well as a feeling of anger in the air. It emphatically denied that it was telling us any falsehoods. The anger would fade almost right away once we got back to asking questions that did not challenge its veracity. And after a few hours of this, two kids, unprepared to actually deal with the oracle they had sought, 
uh, in passing, ran out of things to ask. And we thanked the entity for the answers, but contrary to the instructions that came with the board, which didn't, which I didn't read all the way through until later, I can't believe that I was ever so impetuous, we did not really say goodbye and just and close the session properly. Not that that's necessarily closing the session either, but needless to say, there were subsequent issues. The thing did not leave after the session was over, as we assumed. It stayed on, and at first it was okay. It was low-key. Looking back, I assume it was, a, it was building its power up and or learning its restrictions. My roommate and I would both have feelings of being watched a lot, especially if we were, at, if we were home alone. And over time, the feelings were mixed with more and more creepiness. One bright spot in all of this was that the entity did not seem able or willing to leave the confines of the apartment. It left all of us totally alone when we were not inside of the apartment where the Ouija board was used. One late night, around 2 a.m., my roommate came home from his job and saw a, blue, a bright blue light, large, large screen TV bright type of light, coming from our living room window, and our apartment was upstairs of a two-story building, and he thought that that was odd because I was away visiting my parents that weekend. He went inside to find no more light, but the old feeling of not being alone was there. On another night, my girlfriend was sleeping over, and we were both startled awake simultaneously by what I can only describe as pure terror for no reason. There was no sound, no sight of anything to wake or frighten us, just the uncomfortable feeling of the purest, most powerful, sheer terror I have ever felt. We were both totally paralyzed with fear for 30 minutes, unable to move or speak. Looking back, the only way I can explain how it might have accomplished this is by using a powerful terror thought form that it sent to us as we slept. Though the terror, through the terror rather, we could, however, both sense that the entity was in our room and pacing around. Uh, the bottom and left side of our bed slowly. We both felt that it was pleased and entertained by what it was doing to us, and almost like it was gloating. After a half hour or so of this, we both felt the entity leave the room. It left us alone the rest of that night, and the terror slowly bled away. Needless to say, the girlfriend spent a lot less time at my place, and after that night I was very much afraid of whatever it was, and I had the feeling that things were going to get worse if I didn't do something. This event is what got me to start praying to God regularly, something I continue to do even now, 19 years later. After doing some research, I got the Ouija board back out by myself, closed the session from about four weeks before, according to the instructions, and after that, things quit getting worse. But that feeling of being watched was still there for both my roommate and I, Multiple times a day I started to ask out loud what, that, I, that I was thankful for the entity's original response to my summons and for answering our questions, but that it was no longer welcome here and that it had to go back to where it came from. Every once in a while after saying this, I would get the vague feeling of resentment for about 10 minutes or so. The feelings of being watched started to be less intense over the next couple of weeks and occurred less often. I was still afraid most of the time when I was at home, a home though. Then one day, I was sitting in my bed, and I got the feeling of being watched again. It was particularly strong this time, and I could even sense where it was in the room, over by the window. Something in me snapped. I guess I had had enough of being afraid all the time in my own home and all the frustration and anger that had been piling up for weeks under the fear this thing was heaping upon me came to the surface all at once. In a haze of rage, it's like I jumped out of my body and into onto this thing, and all I could see in my mind's eye was two powerful fists attached to Popeye-like forearms <laughs> pounding on this thing uh, that had been tormenting me for so long. My fists were pounding with huge force on what looked like a gray mist, mist but I did not get a very clear picture. As it was being viciously pounded on and lunged upon, it retreated. It's like I pounded on it for miles and miles, literally, projecting raw rage that I could not control onto it. Then in less than a second, I was back in my body, and the thing was gone, never to return. 
As a side note, I am not an anger management issue kind of guy. This was a one-time event. Who knows, maybe my guardian angel prote- projected a rage thought form onto me to give me the strength to get rid of my unwelcome friend as I had been praying for. I learned some big lessons from all of this, not the least of which is that Ouija boards are not toys. Ouija boards should be shunned. They are effective tools that open up doors to places we don't understand and invite random things into your life. As my story attests, it can be much easier to open a door than to close it, especially if what came through wants to stay here. I have learned that much higher beings... uh, I have learned that higher beings usually have better things to do than to pander to Ouija board summons, like answer prayers or interact with you directly if you ask them while astral projecting. So it's mostly dead people that have not moved on or lower beings that will answer your Ouija board invitation. Be careful what you search for. You might just find it. I've explained all the details I can recall here, but if you have any questions, feel free to let me know. That's pretty crazy. And there again, ladies and gentlemen, the Ouija boards. Those darn boards. Those darn boards. <laughs> I don't know. You know, again, I, th- I think they can be used responsibly. But I think there is something to what this person said is that, you know, what, what vibration energy is going to be answering uh, a board? Um, a bunch of people randomly sitting around in a circle. And if they are, if they're higher vibrational entities, would they be coming through a Ouija board? And that's a great point. Um, you know, I, I know that, you know, I feel it's a blind channel and, it, and that makes it dangerous because you're just putting out this open welcome sign and you don't know what's coming. You don't know what's coming through and you don't know what it really wants. So you're a blind channel. You're making connection with something you don't understand. But it is a good point that most likely it's probably going to be something anchored in this world and why is it anchored in this world well it hasn't maybe moved on so that's a good point uh take it or leave it but i think you know i think again they aren't evil in and of themselves the ouija boards they're just a they're just an oracle they're just a tool uh, much like a hammer and they can all be used responsibly and, and effectively or they can be misused just the same way so <clears throat> I think that message is pounded pretty clear into the psyche of most anybody that's at all interested in the paranormal. I guess I should look at who's here. It's, there's a bunch of people here tonight. That's good. I see a bunch of you are showing up. That's wonderful. Thank you all for being here tonight and uh, being a part of the show. That is still the coolest thing ever. Uh, Monday nights are generally our quieter nights throughout the week, but there's still quite a few of you guys here and still coming, I see. We're almost at 50 people paying attention to me, which is just incredible. (laughs) I'll never get tired of that, ladies and gentlemen. You guys really like me. (laughs) I'll have to do uh, another show on Mandela effects. Those are always fun. I don't think think we've done a podcast about that now that I'm thinking of it. I don't think we have. Maybe we have. I don't know. We've done like 83 of them now, so... It's starting to be hard to remember what we've covered on the podcast versus everything else. And we've got hundreds and hundreds, over 500 videos on YouTube right now that we've done. We've got 80-some podcasts. So there's a lot of portals out there, ladies and gentlemen. Just hours and hours of fun (laughs) waiting to be enjoyed. So if you ever get bored and you're wondering, what should I do? I feel like I want to hear something paranormal. Well... The portal's got you covered for about a good several months of your life. Um, if you, <laughs> I don't know how many hours that is. How much hours is that? I'll have to see if I got a, a, a way to figure out how many hours of shows we have done now. But uh, it's just incredible. I will tell you, though, that the, the, you know, as, as wonderful and responsive as, as YouTube uh, audience has been, we, uh, we have a lot more act, like, amazing growth going on in the podcast than anywhere. I mean, it's just really taken off. And I don't know. I don't know why that is. To be honest with you, I'm not sure, but it sure is really amazing. Uh, It's just wild. In fact, we have like 200 and some thousand minutes viewed, or views rather, 200 and some thousand views on our, 
our YouTube channel, and we've been at that for, I think, going on three years now. Uh, I think 2016. Yeah, so it's three years. Maybe it was 2017. 2017. So two, two and a half years or something like that, or two years and a few months. But it took us all that time. But we've been doing podcasts for just about, well, four solid months right now. Four solid months. The first couple of months were kind of a wash. Uh, well, the first month was just a few days, and then May came around. So how many is that? May, June, July, August, September, October. I guess we've been at it for five solid months now. Um, and we've already surpassed the number of views by a long shot uh, on, our, on our podcast, or the number of downloads, which is the same thing as a view for uh, YouTube. So it's pretty crazy. But thank you all again for your amazing support in our podcasting. It's been really cool. So the next story is coming from Texas, ladies and gentlemen. This one's not very long. It's a pretty quick little story. It says, my aunt was not really into the supernatural, but she respects it. When she lived with my grandma, she used to be uh, visited by my Uncle Joe after he passed away. But soon she got the strength to move out of my grandma's house and get an apartment of her own. She lived there comfortably for about two months until she had this nightmare. And this is what she told me about her first nightmare. She told me she woke up hearing a, my little cousin start crying and, and she was trying to comfort him. And when she turned around, she felt paralyzed and she couldn't move. She said she felt as if someone was on top of her and wouldn't move off. And she said that when she moved, she would get paralyzed again. When she finally woke up, she was sweating. Although I might think this was just one of those nightmares where you can't move. This isn't the only nightmare she's had. After this incident, she had a, an ugly feeling that a man was watching her in her home. She didn't like to be there alone and would invite me constantly over to spend the night. And I'd usually go whenever my cousin was there, my aunt's daughter. But sometimes I'd make an exception to go just to hang out with my aunt. Well, when I went over again, she told me about a dream she had not too long ago. She was taking a shower and she heard someone go into the bathroom. She opened the curtain to see a man, a very, very ugly man, and she said it, it could be Satan. So she closed the curtain and breathed deeply, and she opened it again, and he attacked her. She said it was horrifying, and she didn't have the words to describe how scary it was. She said that it is the reason why she doesn't like to be alone. And whenever she's at home alone, she feels that man a horrible presence. Well, it's been about four years since she's been in her apartment, but even in her new home, she feels that same presence of the man. And I think that it's not the apartment that is haunted, but my aunt is haunted. Please tell me why this man is haunting my aunt. Yeah, that's terrible. If you've got an attachment, and that's, that's it, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, generally these, these spirits attach to something. A lot of times it's a place, uh, a location, can be an object. It could be, you know, your, it could be a, a freaking spoon. You know, you just don't know. Um, be careful about bringing objects into your house that were pre-owned. But sometimes it's a person that they're attached to. And uh, it may be something of you reminds them of something significant in their life. And it could be a good significant thing or a bad significant thing. It's hard to know. But um, it's really important to break those attachments. So that's why you got to learn about cleansing. Everybody should learn about cleansing because these energies come and go. But if they, if they anchor, I mean, this is a great example of, uh, of an attachment that's, you know, just really gone south. So she's still feeling that presence around. That's horrid. And you got to get that, get that taken care of because... The only thing that will usually happen is they don't usually just fade away. Once they have that attachment, that doesn't just get better by itself. you just got to really be incredibly proactive and clear that because, you know, and sometimes it can be just as simple as you saying, enough, you're not welcome here, and put up your energy, put up your, you know, rally your strength, your emotion, and uh, cast it off. But uh, generally, I think it's best to, uh, you know, call in some other person that can be some kind of spiritual teacher or guide or, or, or healer. Um, could be a religious figure, could be a, a, some kind of practitioner. It's up to you. But, uh, you know, someone that you, you feel is going to be real positive and will help you take care of that. And sometimes those attachments come because people give them to us. 
and that's a whole other issue that we'll have to cover on the show sometime. But sometimes attachments aren't quite as random as we, <laughs> as we uh, may believe. Sometimes they are cast onto us, and that's a whole different animal. And that's the kind of thing you're going to need help to break. Um, because there's a, there's an energy binding that that accompanies that not only of the entities but uh, of another person and uh, it's important to get those broken really quick so uh, it does, you know I mean as long as you're aware of it you can usually you know you usually be fine as long as you take proactive steps to get rid of those kind of things but there are some malicious people out there practicing some really uh, odd beliefs I'll just leave it there but. Uh, you got to be careful and, uh, you know, use, use, uh, use, use your uh, shielding techniques as much as you can. All right, so that's pretty creepy, though. I don't know. Those, those personal attachments are extraordinarily creepy because if it's in a place or an object, you can usually take care of those pretty easily. You either move or get that place cleansed or you find out which object it is and get, get rid of it. But if it's a person, if it's attached to you directly, then... It's really hard to get away from those just by yourself. Okay, so let's move on to another one. This one's coming from Ohio. Oh, this one's a little long. This one's going to take a few minutes, but I hope it's good. <clears throat> it says, I work in a daycare in Westchester, Ohio, and the director of the daycare wants us to keep these things on the down low because they're afraid that the parents will pull their children out of the daycare. Now, see, that's selfish as hell. <laughs> I mean, if you've got some weird crap going on spiritually at your place, if you love kids at all, you're going to make sure that those kids are, are not there, not because you're afraid to lose business. Ugh. But I am so interested in everything that has happened that I have to share. The first odd thing I experienced while working at the daycare happened about a year ago. One Friday night a month, uh, two employees work what we call parent nights out. And we work from 8 to midnight and usually have around five or less kids. Well, my coworker at the time, Katie, and I put a movie on for the two kids we had that night, and they both fell asleep before 11. The room we were in is right next to the kitchen, and there's a big open glass free window that connects the room to the kitchen. And we both heard the sound of things falling in the kitchen, like utensils or dishes or something. Well, we both freaked out because it was late and no one else was there. Well, I decided to go into the kitchen thinking maybe it was something just fell over. However, there was nothing on the floor or on the counters. Everything was in place and put away. Um, I didn't really have anything happen after that until this past April. And I worked parents' night out again, and this time it was with my coworker Sarah, and we both stayed in the same room as before. And that night we had five children. One was a baby, and I told Sarah that I was going to get, go get a crib for him. Since the baby room was on the other side of the building, I carried the baby along with me. When I entered the baby room, all seemed normal. The cribs all have wheels on them, so I went and grabbed one and started wheeling it towards the door, and just as I was about to leave the room, one of the baby swings started swinging. I breathed in really quickly, stopped in my tracks, and put my hand to my mouth, I was so afraid, I didn't know what to do. Finally, I grabbed the crib and kept going, and I clutched the baby to my body with my other arm and about ran down the hall to the original room. When I returned to the room, Sarah could see that I was shaking and breathing heavily. I told her what had happened, and we both decided to not leave the room again until the end of the night. And when that time finally came, we left through the front door along the back of the side of the building are the playgrounds and two gates to separate them. I saw that both the gates were open, even though I know for a fact that I had shut them before and Sarah and I went, out, went into the building. The following Monday, another co-worker, Amanda, confirmed that she also had a similar experience while in the building uh, for Parents' Night Out. She looked at me and asked, what did the, when did the swing start moving? Was it right as you were leaving? I was stunned. It wasn't just my imagination. I decided that I was never doing another parent's night out. I had never experienced anything creepy during the day, so I was never scared at work, usually. However, this past month, the children have been seeing a lot of things. I work with the toddlers around the age of two. A couple of weeks ago, one of my kids was sitting on the potty. We have uh, a bathroom inside of our classroom, 
and it's right next to the kitchen area, and I was sweeping while she sat on the bathroom, and I heard her strike up a conversation. Well, thinking another child was in there with her, I turned around and looked, and she's sitting on the toilet chatting away and staring up towards her left as if someone were standing by the toilet. However, no one is there, and I say, Peyton, who are you talking to? And she looks back at her left and says, someone, but never says more than that. Last week, a boy in my class was lying on his cot during nap time. Sarah, the same coworker uh, I did parents' night out with, also teaches in this room with me, and we were talking while the kids were settling down on their cots. We both stop at the same time and look over at Aiden, and he has his arms stretched out towards the bathroom, and he's saying, please come here, please, please come here. We break his attention and ask, who is he talking to? He only points towards the bathroom. Yesterday, Peyton, the same girl that was sitting on the potty, was lying on her cot towards the back of, of the room. I was sitting in a chair in the kitchen right next to the ba bathroom, and I see Peyton start waving, thinking she is waving at me. I wave back, and she keeps wa waving, and I ask Peyton, are you waving at me? And she shakes her head no. Today, today is the last thing I'm going to write about. My coworker Amanda claims that she was walking down the hall toward her room, which is the baby room. In that hallway, she passed our room, and then the room next to us, the room next to ours was vacant because the children were napping in another room, and some classes combined for nap time. And she was holding one of the babies, which also happened to be her child, and she said that he looked out, he looked out into the vacant room and started smiling as they passed the doorway. He about jumped out of her arms, reaching for someone, although no one was there. And I'm afraid, but very interested, interested at the same time. I want to know if there are, truly is a haunting, or if we all just have, uh, are just crazy and looking into everything too much. Yeah, that's, <laughs> those, those are, uh, those, I don't know if I'd say it's a haunting, but you've got presences. Um, I, I don't necessarily think anything dangerous is going on there, at least not not from what is being explained, but I don't know, when you're taking care of other people's kids, that's something you don't want to do wrong. That's something you don't want to do wrong. You've got, <laughs> you know, that's horrible. If you know that you've got a, a haunting in your presence, then you really got to do everything you can to get rid of it because you don't want to be wrong about it. Yeesh. I don't know. Strangeness, ladies and gentlemen. But that's what we thrive on here on the portal. We live in the strangeness. Let's see what's going on next here. Georgia is next. This one's a short one. It says, I don't have any long in-depth experience, so I'll tell you shorter ones. Over the years, the room behind mine has always felt haunted. I've heard doors open and close and seen them. Heard knocking noises, seen shadows, and saw what I believe was a ghost in the hallway. More recently, I was freaking out and slept in the haunted room with my mom. Before I could even try to fall asleep, I was hearing muffled voices that sounded completely different from the TV in my room. There were also noises sounding like a phone, and then a woman's muffled voice, and the other voices sounded male, and the door kept shaking. I did eventually fall asleep, though. I've always had two different dreams involving me mostly getting possessed, so I thought maybe they were actually trying to do that but couldn't. One dream involved a ghost opening and closing my blinds, which are covered by a thick cloth now. At night, whenever I look at the cloth, it moves, even though nothing else in my room is, and it's pretty heavy. I think they enjoy teasing me. Now, normally, Mom has never believed... Uh, I was actually seeing or hearing anything, but she finally believed me when she spent the night alone and heard door-opening noises as well and felt watched. She might have just been imagining it, but she's been alone for more than two days before the activity increased, so I believe what she's seen. The ghosts haven't really done anything else, so should I really try to get them to leave, or should I allow them to stay? Besides, I don't think they want to listen, seeing as I've openly asked them to go away before. But, so, you know, I don't know. I guess it depends on the person, right? It depends on what you're comfortable with. Do you want a ghostly presence in your house or don't you? 
Now, to me, it doesn't generally bother me as long as things are peaceful and good. I, I think it's kind of sweet, actually. I don't know. I mean, that's just me. I'm obviously a little bizarre because I do a show like this. But I, I have to say that, you know, I have, we've had discussions with a friend of ours, Jeffrey Seelman, who's, who's an exorcist and a spiritual teacher. And uh, he's, he's said very clearly that you, if you think you've got a spirit hanging around, get him out. And he says very, very de decisively, he's like, they don't belong there. And he said, would you let somebody come in from the street and sit and watch you as you live your life and, and they're like showering and getting dressed? And would you let someone just come in and watch you? And he said, of course you wouldn't. So why would you want some unseen presence doing the same thing? He said, get them out. They don't belong there. There's, they need to leave. <laughs> and he's probably right. You know, I don't know. For me... I, I don't know. I, I guess I don't feel the need to cast everything out, but I do feel that if it has a weird vibe or if it's if if something something's going on that I feel that it's trying to be creepy, then it's got to get the hell out. I don't have any time for that. That's you no, know, it's time to go. But if it's just something that's here, uh, maybe it's maybe it finds comfort here. I don't know. Maybe it's uh, maybe it was always here. Like I believe there's an old lady presence here. Um, and possibly an old man presence, but he's, he's not coming around too much or, or he's much more subtle, but I smell her perfume many nights, uh, just in the middle of different places. It's just this old flowery smell and I don't have anything like that in my house. I mean, <laughs> it's like an old grandma perfume. If you think about what that smells like, I run into that smell quite a bit in the house here. And, and I don't think that she's, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that she was probably the one that was continually knocking stuff off the walls back here because I, I think it kind of freaks her out. She doesn't like this kind of stuff. But, um, I, you know, I've had dialogues about that. I'm like, look, this is a show I do. This is a discussion we have, and, and I'm not encouraging bad things. I'm just talking about this. And, and, and then I nailed the crap up on the walls. So, so far she hasn't pulled it back down, if it is indeed her. Um, how can I know that? I don't know. Some things just come to me. Some things don't. I mean, I don't claim to be a psychic, but I do get impressions and, I, and you know, with that and the perfume. So I think this room was probably pretty, maybe it was her bedroom for God's sakes, you know, maybe it was where she, where she lived and slept most of the time. But, uh, um, it kind of depends on you guys, you know, what you want. If you're kind if you're okay with that kind of, uh, cooperation, then cool, let it go until something happens that you feel you need to you need to address, but other people are just like, nope, they live their lives. It's time for them to go. They should be moved on. And maybe that's right. Maybe that's the more wise choice. I don't know. But uh, I, guess, I guess you just got to come to your own conclusion about that and make your own choice. So that's my two cents on it. That's a great question. When, when do you kick them out? I don't know. I guess if they do something that crosses the line, you know, much like you would for a person. Uh, I don't think so. The ghost app still right? No, I don't really listen to the ghost app anymore. Um, the reason being it's on the laptop that's now being used for music over there. So I don't run the ghost app as much anymore. Um, in fact, I don't, I don't run it at all. I could run it on this computer. I have it installed here. Um, but I've never ran it during the shows. I got so many other things running on this computer as it is. And, uh, I just figure, well, I don't, you know, it, it, it was interesting, very interesting, but I never saw enough compelling stuff come from it that I felt that it was, it was truly adding anything. It was just sometimes every once in a great while something would correlate, and that I found that interesting. But no, I don't normally run the, the ghost apps during the course of the show anymore. So I used to run it on the laptop that was right here, but now that laptop is on the other side of the studio hooked up to my, my music recording equipment. So I don't have it set up here. Um, yeah, so, but thanks for asking, Julia. I appreciate that. Go, I meant. Um, let's see, anything else going on in the chat? Am I missing anything? Uh, da -da, da -da. Okay. No, I don't think so. Thank you, Julia, for the question. It lets me know you're paying attention. <laughs> All right, so the next one is Oregon. Let me look at the time. I don't know how long we've been at this. Yeah, I'll do one more story. I guess it's 50 minutes already. My God, this flies fast. You know, I've been doing this, this show for th over three years now, ladies and gentlemen. And I don't know how it happens, but my God, 
the time just screams by. It's crazy. It really, I mean, honest to God, I don't understand how so much time can go so incredibly quickly, but there you have it. I guess I just like, like to, uh, like to do me some shows, but here's, it's kind of a longer one. So we'll end on this one. This coming from Oregon and says, or sorry, Don, Don, pay attention. It comes from Oregon. See, I told you I could learn. I did not say Oregon. All right, then the next events that you will read here, I personally didn't experience, but my father did, and he doesn't even believe in anything supernatural until he threw the until through the years it got weirder in the house. <laughs> uh, the first happening was before I was born. My parents lived in the house for three years, and to make the home much homey, the house much homey. To make the house much homey, that doesn't sound, doesn't sound right, so homier, I think, they got a cat, Snuggles. The cat would sleep on the bed with them, and my dad said that he and my mother were awakened from a very deep sleep by Snuggles hissing and growling at something in the hallway. My dad looked in the hall, hallway from the bed and saw eyes looking at them, no, no body. He didn't say if he saw a face, he just remembers the eyes. He got up and went to see if there was an intruder, but no windows were open and doors were shut and locked and no one else was in the house. He forgot about it until six years later. Six years later, I was four years old. My room is across from my parents' room. And one night, my dad was sitting at the end of his bed, which you can see my bedroom from. And the door was shut. My doorknob started rattling and shaking like someone was locked in and trying to get out. The only thing was, I didn't have a lock on my door. So my dad thought it was that it was me, so he yelled, Michelle, open the door. Well, nothing happened, and the door continued to shake and rattle. He continued to call out to me to open the door when finally he got fed up and came to the door and knocked, and I came running around the corner of the hall. My dad had a shocked look on his face and went pale. He yelled for me to go to my mother, and so I did. My dad tried to open the door by using the doorknob, but it wouldn't open. Again, I didn't have a lock on my door, so he used his shoulder to get in, and that worked, and when he got into the room, the room was dark. No one was in it, but my dad said that he remembers walking in only two feet and feeling a very, very cold spot. My own personal experience, seven years later, Snuggles, our cat, passed away. Not only three days later, I was 11 years old, when I walked out of my room, walked out of my dad's room, and I looked down the hall, and I saw Snuggles run down the hall. Being sad and young, I didn't understand, and I ran to go get her and hug her because I missed her. And when I went around the corner, she wasn't there. And I remembered that she was gone, and then I cried more. Two years after that, I was in New York on a school trip uh, when this next event took place. My dad was leaving for work, and he remembers... Uh, walking by two backpacks that was full of stuff pushed up against the wall. And then he went to the front door, set the alarm, and looked back in the room and definitely seeing the bags. When he got home, he turned the alarm off and locked the, looked in the room, and the backpacks were in the middle of the room. Everything that was inside of them was thrown out of it, and he thought it was odd because, uh, obviously, so he checked the whole house to see if he left a window open and nothing was out of the normal except the bags. So he called my mom to see if uh, I went over at all during the day. He didn't know that I was in New York, by the way. He still doesn't know, even though it's been about four, four years. My mom told him that I was hanging out with a friend and that I had not been there. So he asked if she was over that day, and she said, no, I'm still at work. He cleaned the mess up and thought nothing of it. Two years later, when my dad was walking past a mirror in the house, he saw in the corner of his eye that his reflection was going the other way. So he looked in the mirror, and it wasn't him. Then maybe a couple months later, he woke up to glass being shattered. He got up and immediately, and every light in his room, every light but his room light was on. Most people might not find that weird, probably thinking, oh, he forgot to turn the lights off. But if you knew my father... He doesn't just forget something like that. He double-checks everything, especially before he goes to bed. When he walked in the living room, the TV was on, and his chair was rocking. 
He turned the lights out and went to bed. <laughs> My dad still lives in the house, but we've been trying to get him uh, to get it ready to sell, but he hasn't done anything. My dad started dating this very religious woman, and she got him to use holy water in the house. And he did and says that he hasn't experienced anything weird. And thank you for hearing or for bearing with me and reading these long stories. That's very interesting. Very interesting long stories. Yes, please likes. Please likes. Uh, I haven't seen Duke in here tonight. Is he? Yeah, we're, yeah, he's here. Okay, Duke's here. He's just being quiet. Duke, you're being too quiet. I didn't do a roll call tonight, but uh, I know that a bunch of you are here, and I'm absolutely thrilled that you were here. Thank you so much for being a part of all of the Paranormal Portal shows. Um, you guys are absolutely amazing. It means the world to us. Don and I both are, again, extraordinarily uh, beside ourselves with the amount of kindness and support so many of you are showing to us uh, for the show. But um, I guess that's all I got for you. I hope it was good enough, and I hope you're all safely tucked in bed, ready to go to sleep. Uh, but if not, then whenever you do go to sleep, I hope you dream sweetly. All right, guys, that's going to wrap it up for me. Love you all. Be good, be kind, be nice. Take care of each other. Help each other out. Find the magic in every day. And remember to smile as much as you can. But I'm going to get going. I hope you guys have a great night. And uh, I'll be back tomorrow night. See you then.